Andrea Stamatis. Él es coordinador del programa de grado y el director de laboratorio en el Departamento de Ejercicio y Ciencias de la Nutrición de la Universidad Estatal de Nueva York en Plattsburgh, eh, Nueva York. El doctor Stamatis es más conocido por su investigación sobre la fortaleza mental en el deporte. Ha sido autor y coautor de diversos artículos revisados por pares y ha dictado conferencias en varios países sobre este tema. Además de la academia, el doctor Stamatis ha trabajado varios años como entrenador de acondicionamiento de anuncios de fuerza en Europa y Estados Unidos. Entre otras organizaciones profesionales, el doctor Stamatis está certificado a través del Colegio Americano de Medicina del Deporte y la Asociación Nacional de Fuerza y Acondicionamiento. Sirve como miembro en general del Comité Ejecutivo del Capítulo del Gran eh, New York en la Junta de Certificación de la Asociación de Entrenadores Colegiados de Fuerza y Acondicionamiento y como editor de sección para Psicología y Comportamiento en el International Journal of Exercise Science. Todavía posee dos gimnasios y varias tiendas de suplementos alimenticios en Grecia. Vamos a darle una cordial bienvenida al doctor con su presentación, el ejercicio y bienestar psicológico. Thank you. Uh, Teresa, for the introduction, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. Is it working? Okay, great. Yes, Andreas. So, uh, as you can see, I have activated the subtitles at the bottom. I don't know if you can see them, and they translated in Spanish. So, hopefully, that will help you uh, understand a little bit more about what I'm going to say today. So uh, uh, my name is Andreas. I am an associate professor at the University, State University of New York, and uh, more specifically in the Department of Exercise and Nutrition Science. Uh, it is an honor to be here. I want to thank, first of all, Dr. Figueroa for inviting me. Uh, it's always a pleasure to see you. I have great uh, memories from Veracruz and hopefully I'll be able to visit again soon. Uh, it's also a great honor because the rector is here. Uh, so I wanna thank everybody and for being here today. And I'm pretty excited to talk to you about um, exercise psychology. So today, uh, this is what we're covering, exercise and psychological well-being, and more specifically, the topics to be covered are uh, exercise and anxiety and depression, exercise and mood states, exercise and psychological well being, the relationship between exercise, personality changes, and cognitive functioning, the so called runner's high, and if and how we can use exercise as an adjunct to therapy. So, six topics. It's going to be a short uh, presentation. So, let's start. First of all, let's talk a little bit about exercise and anxiety and depression. Uh, most of the uh, research we have is uh, aerobic, aerobic exercise. And we used to think that high intensity was necessary uh, to get the benefits uh, when it's about psychological well being. Uh, now we don't, we have enough evidence to know that high intensity is not necessary. You can get the benefits. Uh, even with moderate and even with low intensity. We have also research right now with um, non-aerobic exercise, anaerobic exercise, such as strength training and yoga, and we can still see the benefits on psychological well-being. One key point that I want to talk about before we move any further is that we do have strong evidence um, to establish a relationship between exercise and psychological well-being. So we can say that the more we exercise, the better we feel. Also, the better we feel, the more we exercise. So we do have enough evidence um, to establish this bi-directional relationship. However, uh, we're not exactly sure if it's a causal relationship. We don't have very strong evidence for that. All right, this is a pretty uh, intense um, slide. It has a lot of information. 
Uh, and the very first thing I want to say is that the benefits of exercise can be grouped in two big categories. We can have acute benefits, which are the benefits we get right after exercising. And we can also get chronic benefits, which are the effects that we get that have longer duration. And we usually get them if we exercise for a longer period of time. So um, some examples of acute be benefits. First of all, uh, the benefits we get right after exercising last from four to 24 hours. Uh, the most benefits we get is if uh, the intensity is between 30 and 70% of our heart rate maximum. For anaerobic, it's between 30 and 70. Now, if we compare exercise with just resting, relaxing, it's not that we're getting more benefits if we exercise. What we get though, if we exercise is that benefits that last longer, okay? Very uh, helpful with uh, people who have elevated levels of anxiety and the, the most effects we get them for um, duration up to 30 minutes. When we go to chronic, we have chronic effects uh, in depression and anxiety in several traits such as neuro neurotism, uh, virus, various stress indicators, and the effects we're getting, we see them in all ages, both sexes, and it doesn't depend on the fitness level. We have low level fitness participants who get those chronic effects and high level fitness participants. Now, something that is really important to know is that exercise has been found to be as effective as psychotherapy in reducing depression. And that goes for both aerobic and anaerobic. All right, let's talk a little bit now for the second thing we have to talk about, mood changes. So mood uh, is not just a feeling. When we're talking about moods, we're talking about something that lasts a little bit longer. We don't know when it started or when it ended. Usually it's from some kind of internal factor. That's how it starts. Uh, in any case, we see positive changes uh, with exercise, no matter how many times uh, our mood changes throughout the day. One important thing to know here is uh, we have this thing in psychology called autonomy. So if you choose the mode of exercise, you get more benefits compared to the people who didn't choose the mode of uh, exercise. So that is an important thing uh, when you are exercising or, or when you are prescribing exercises, exercise as coaches or trainers. Also, another thing to remember is how you perceive your own fitness level affects your uh, mood, mood more than your actual fitness level. So it's about your perception about yourself. So how do you get, how can you get, how can you uh, ameliorate your mood? Use rhythm, rhythm, uh, abdominal exercise breathing. Uh, try to avoid competing with others, right? Try to choose something that's a close predictable activity such as running from point A to point B or swimming from point A to point B. Don't use something such as playing a pickup game of basketball because it's very unpredictable. Use something rhythm, rhythmic and uh, something that ha has repetitive exercise movements. 20 to 30 minutes, moderate intensity, two to three times per week and make it as enjoyable as possible. Now, the third thing for today, when uh, we talk about the psychological well-being and how exercise affects psychological well-being, you, we usually uh, talk about first physiological, but also psychological. Uh, so the first thing we're going to talk about is the physiological explanations, how this is happening. First of all, we have uh, enhanced increased cerebral blood flow, which means more oxygen is going to the brain, which is, as you understand, very important and very beneficial. Also, we have changes in brain neurotransmitters. Um, for example, norepinephrine. You know that norepinephrine and adrenal adrenaline, especially when they work together, they increase the blood flow, the blood, blood pressure. 
you feel more energy, right? Serotonin, you know that serotonin is associated with anxiety and depression. And a lot of people are taking uh, medicine because they have issues with their serotonin. Endorphins and the endocannabinoid receptors, I'm gonna leave that so I can talk about it later on when I talk about the runner's high. Uh, as we're exercising, we're also getting structural changes in the brain because of the new movements that we're doing. Okay, and of course, reduction in muscle tension. Now let's talk about the psychological explanations. You see that uh, exercise affects control, competency, self-efficacy, self-concept, self-esteem. And of course, we have all these interactions, and especially if we're going to the gym or we participate in a group activity or in a team, which also gives us an opportunity to have some fun and enjoy uh, ourselves. All right, this is the fourth thing for today. How can exercise change our personality and our cognitive functioning? Let's talk about personality first. We have evidence that it affects self-sufficiency and intelligence, also self-esteem. When we talk about cognitive functioning, we know that exercise, especially over longer periods of time, is associated with benefits in cognitive functioning and more specifically in problem solving and planning. Executive central command is affected by uh, exercise. And when we talk about kids, when we integrate physical activity in the classroom, we see increases in motivation, competence, and effort. And also we see a lot of benefits with moderate to vigorous intensity in kids with ADHD. All right, another group of people that um, get a lot of benefits from exercise in cognitive function is older adults, especially when they're doing some kind of exercise that includes um, coordination or thinking about what they have to do. So that helps them a lot with uh, cognitive functioning. If we combine ways of training, so no just aerobic, but also anaerobic and flexibility training, Another important thing here is that we see more benefits in females than uh, males. Concerning duration, we see more benefits if we exceed 30 minutes per session. Of course, in older adults, because they have issues with uh, AIDS brain, it is very beneficial because it protects their brain. And another cool thing here uh, about older adults is that the benefits that we see the effects, the positive effects that we see from exercise in terms of cognitive functioning, we see more in older adults compared to the general population. All right, let's talk about runner's high. There's a lot of uh, debate uh, and uh, some people say it doesn't exist, some people say it exists. Uh, those who say that it exists, of course, talk about some kind of euphoric sensation uh, people are feeling very good. Uh, they appreciate time and nature and they're feeling really great. Um, the, there are very, very various hypotheses that uh, have tried to explain uh, that euphoric sensation. The, most, uh, the one that is most accepted or more popular is the endorphin hypothesis where we have release of opioid peptides in the brain and those peptides um, take away the pain in a way. So if you feel less pain, the activity feels more enjoyable. So now, how can you, which are the characteristics? How can you create the conditions to actually reach that point of runner's high? Uh, there are various uh, testimonies. So um, research has tried to combine all that information and from what people have said that say that they feel it, um, if you have fewer distractions, if the weather is cool and calm, low humidity, and the duration is around 30 minutes or up to 10 kilometers, those are the conditions that will help you feel that uh, sensation. And of course, there's a huge variability based on the person, a specific person and the specific conditions. But if you have felt it, whatever you did and you felt it, just keep doing the same. That would be my advice. 
All right, the last thing for today, the sixth thing uh, is, can we use exercise uh, as a junk to therapy? Well, it is not for everybody. So yes, but it depends. And when we do use exercise, we should use it as part of a plan that includes more modes of therapy. So exercise and psychotherapy maybe in medicine, okay? Not exercise by itself. Of course, when we're trying to uh, include exercise, we need to talk with our clients and we need to talk about their experiences, the past experiences. Did they have good experiences or did they have bad experiences? Uh, we should include a variety of activities because adherence is a big issue. And stemming from that, we should prescribe something that is practical and functional for them. So do some kind of work at the house or use their bike to go to the work. Again, we're trying to make it enjoyable and we're trying to increase adherence. So if there's no adherence, we should have a plan B, how we can find other ways for them to uh, be physically active. When we have to prescribe exercise, of course, there, there's, there's specific professionals who can do that. A psychologist cannot prescribe exercise. So a psychologist has to work with a trainer, okay? So there are specific people who know how to do it. And when they're prescribing exercise, of course, it has to be individualized, which means you have to take uh, the needs of your specific client and create something that it is unique for them. All right, so let's see what we have to remember from this presentation. Take home point one, which are the effects of exercise on anxiety and depression? We get the maximum effects if it is enjoyable and if it's regular. When we, in terms of intensity, when it's moderate, in terms of duration, uh, when it is 20 to 30 minutes, uh, aerobic, and at the end, as we said, the relationship between exercise and psychological well being is more correlational than causal. Take home point two what's the relationship between exercise and mood states? It is positive. So, yes, regular exercise does change mood states. Examples we have decrease in fatigue and anger and increase in vigor, alertness, and energy. When do we get the most of it? when we have low intensity exercise, either aerobic or anaerobic. Take home point three, which are the effects of exercise on psychological well-being? Well, the relationship is positive. And when we're trying to explain that relationship, we can, we can explain it from a psychological point of view, where we see feelings of competency and a sense of control, and from a physiological point of view, where we see reductions in muscle tension increases in cerebral flow, and so on and so forth. Take home point four. So which are the relationships among exercise, personality changes, and cognitive functioning? The relationship is positive. We can see positive changes. So for example, in personality, we see uh, increases self-confidence. And in cognitive functioning, we see uh, positive changes in attentional control. Take home point number five, what is the runner's high? So who is experiencing the most, right? Based on the name, uh, of course, runners experience uh, runner's high the most. Uh, what does it feel? How does it feel? What does it include? A mental alertness, liberation, a lift in the legs, a suppressed pain, uh, and acceleration. Conditions, we, we talked about the conditions. There are a lot of uh, different testimonies. Uh, most of the time we say around 30 minutes and some people say up to 10 kilometers. But both, in both cases, it has to be a pace that is comfortable for you. And the last thing for today, can we use exercise as an adjunct to therapy? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, the most popular uh, mode is running. And that's why, because it is more practical it's inexpensive and it's time efficient. However, exercise is not for everybody. So if you have a clinical disorder and especially some 
high risk of cardiovascular disease. You may have metabolic syndrome. You have high blood pressure. You have to be, so we have to be really careful when we prescribe exercise as an adjunct to therapy. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you can let me know right now or you can send them here. We can connect through social media. All these are my professional accounts. My email address is all the way at the end. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions or Dr. Figueroa. Adelante, Teresa. Sí. Muchas gracias, Andreas. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Samantis. Y voy a precisar algunos puntos, pues el, el doctor amablemente... Eh...